one to witness the birth of the incredible Nintendo Entertainment System. The one to play with Rob, the extraordinary video robot, batteries not included. He helps you tackle even the toughest challenge. Will you be the first to raise the incredibly accurate Zapper and play games like Duck Hunt or action-packed Hogan's Alley and high-flying Kung Fu, each sold separately? Will you be the one to experience the Nintendo Entertainment System? Comes with Rob, Zapper, Control Deck, two controllers, Gyromite, and Duck Hunt.
Good morning, everyone. Hello, I'm streaming live here on my second day of this winter 2021 class called Games and Culture. I, just, I say the second day, but it already feels like the second week because we did so much yesterday. At least I did so much yesterday. Uh, that was a lot. Um, but here we are again, and I've got some more things to do today, some more things to show you and talk about and ask you to work on. And uh, today will be a little different today. So. Um, a little bit less uh, work for me, unfortunately. Well, unfortunately for you, I guess. A little bit less work for me, a little bit more for you. So I um, hope you all are doing well out there. If you have a minute, I mean, if you're watching, um, feel free to say hi in the Discord chat, which shows up here. Or you can use the Twitch chat, too, if you want. But I don't check that as often. I, I have it in another, another screen over here to my left. So I don't see that quite as quickly. Um, but I should see your Discord comments up here. Also, let me know if you if you can how the sound is and how the video looks. Um, the preview that I'm seeing looks a little bit laggy. I mean, the, the frame rate looks iffy um, in my preview on OBS, but sometimes that doesn't mean that, like sometimes it still outputs okay. So uh, let me know how it looks. Um, but, you know, uh, I like to tweak things. I like to make it look as smooth as possible, bearing in mind that it doesn't make a huge difference in terms of like my ability to teach you things. I can still do that even if my frame rate is 15, uh, but uh, I would like it to be better. It looks like it's holding steady at 30 right now, which is what I, I set it to. So anyway, um, good day. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> Today, I actually, I had a pretty ambitious plan and I just sort of kept uh, adding content. So I, it ended up, it, it turns out I'm going to have to shift things into tomorrow a little bit. Uh, in terms of what I had originally planned, but uh, I want to talk about that and then go through th um, and then go through it with you today. This is, as you can see, the schedule for today. So I first want to start off talking about that and your homework and uh, some other things uh, related to that. So cool. Um, I hope you all are doing well. And actually, if you don't mind, if you could, you, you, even if you don't feel like it, if you don't mind just saying hi in the chat, that will let me know that you're watching, and then I can. Look, when I look back later, I can kind of make sure I know, because I, I want to make sure everyone's checking in. So uh, I want to make sure you're either watching live now or that you watch it later. So either way, just, just say hi really quickly. I'd appreciate that. So good, great. Hello, hi, Kate, hi, Maddie, hi, Kelly. Thanks, uh, thanks for doing that. I always appreciate that. Good morning. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, oh, by the way, I just remembered, I, I have not matched up everyone's actual nicknames to their uh, Discord nicknames to their actual names. Many of you are using your real names, which is fine. Many of you are using nicknames, which is fine. But I do need to make sure I know who is who. So, um, uh, Hoodie Jello YT, I'm not sure who, who you are. So, if you don't mind, send me a message in Discord so I know your actual name. You don't have to change your nickname in Discord. I just want to make sure I know who you are. Uh, <laughs> just thought you say hi. All right, cool. So let me let me pull down the background music. Um, hope you enjoy the background music, by the way. That's uh, you know that was flagellation by Occam's Laser. Um, so uh, that's uh, I, it's just a synth wave station that I found on this thing, uh, uh, Pretzel, which is uh, apparently a streaming service kind of like Spotify, but everything is um, free for as far as streaming goes. So uh, I mean, you're not gonna, it's not gonna, the artists are not gonna send me a takedown for using it on the stream. And it's, you know, when it's just like that, that preview kind of music, I don't, I don't care if it's that great or I mean the music is, is good but I don't care if it's that good if that makes sense um, anyway uh, let's see um, the squirrels have been pretty active right outside my window here by the way they've um, not figured out how to get I don't know if they've even noticed the bird feeder that's right above them yet but it's uh, they've dug many holes uh, right right around here so I think they are mainly over here to dig up their own nuts that they buried a while ago so I don't think they're actually I don't think they've actually figured out that there's a bird feeder there. So, uh, but I'm keeping an eye on it and I will keep you updated um, as I, as that develops. Uh, okay. So here's our plan for today. And you can see it on the screen here to that side. Um, this is the, uh, yeah, mirror. Yeah, there we go. So up, up there, you can see the, the plan for today, uh, that the live stream right now, which is, uh, so 10 AM, this will go about an hour. Um, we're going to talk about video games on, on my live stream here and show you some things. And then, uh, for the second hour, uh, today and, the, and like uh, just to be honest like if you're doing this later like if you're watching this asynchronously you can still do this on your own of course but uh, it would be great to do it together with your your peers as I, uh, I'll show you in a moment um, but uh, either way I would like you to spend about an hour on the second phase of this class whenever that happens to be for you um, exploring some second and third generation games and I'll show you how to do that 
Uh, and then after that, uh, I would like for you to meet with your group in Discord. And I say meet, that's really just a meeting if you happen to be online at the same time, which hopefully you will be, but if not, you can still contribute to a conversation asynchronously in Discord. So please do that. And there's some instructions later down on this page for the kinds of things I'd like for you to talk about. And then finally, actually I need to edit this because I do have a final, um, uh, a final section, final phase for today. Uh, let me add, I forgot to add this to the summary, but let's say around 115, yeah. Um, let's uh, uh, final demo stream. What are we going to call that? I had a heading for that was down here. What did I call that? Yeah, final thoughts and hopefully a demo. Um, This will be on Twitch again. So what I'm going to be doing for this final phase of class today, which is not going to be a lecture, is I'm going to be demonstrating some things and showing you some systems uh, that you can experience in emulation, but I'm going to show you the real thing, hopefully, if I can get it hooked up and working. So um, that's, I say hopefully, because I'm going to have to spend that time while you're working on and playing some games on their emulators. Um, I'm going to be trying to f set up my physical game console and actually play it and the, um, I don't know if it's going to work so uh, I don't know if it's there's there are several potential points of failure one is that the console just might not turn on in, anymore um, that's always a risk with the old, older uh, games um, the other risk is that I'm not sure I'm not totally sure how I'm going to get it into OBS so I can send it through twitch but my plan basically is just to plug in an old TV and point a webcam at it and then adjust the frame rates until it looks okay. So I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I imagine this will take me at least an hour to figure out. So that's the uh, that's my plan. That's what I'm going to be doing while you all are working on, em on emulators. Um, so I'll talk about that in a little bit, but and I'll show it to you, and then I'll, this is all still building up to my lecture for today. But uh, I also want to tell you about some homework, some things that I'd like for you to look at before class tomorrow, if possible. So these are things that we're going to talk about tomorrow. Um, as it turns out, I'm going to be still talking about video game generations tomorrow, but also I want to introduce the idea of video game genre because this is another structural way of thinking about video games that helps us slice and dice video games into pieces and groups and categories that we can start making sense of. Um, if we look at sort of the big ball of the thousands of video games that have ever been created, we, it, it's often convenient to put them into groups, which is kind of what we're doing today with generations. So we've got first gen, second gen, third gen, and so on. And this gives us a set of, instead of 10,000 games, let's look at 500 games. Um, and that's a, a way to uh, start getting a handle on it. Um, genre is another way. So the genre is another shortcut to getting through some things. And yeah, homework. Um, it's a, a way to understand uh, features of games, but also to think about how, how a game, one game is like or is not another and to understand innovation in certain categories. And it's a, it's a, it's a useful construct. Um, and we'll talk about how to use it. So here's, a, here's the things I'd like you to look at. Now these are uh, fairly short. This one should be, like, I don't know if this link will work. I hope it will. Let's find out. Um, this should be a link into a specific page. Oh, great. No, it's not letting me in. Um, it's supposed to be a link into a specific page of understanding video games. Um, and that's annoying that it's not working. Um, especially, it's also annoying because you should be able to get to it through the library reading list, but you all uh, confirmed yesterday that you weren't able to because the list hasn't been published yet. So I need to figure that out with a librarian, but uh, I think some of you did figure out how to fig how to access this book. Um, you know, I, I'm going to show it to you kind of the long way right now, but I'll, I'll give you, uh, I will give you, I, I will follow up with the librarian and figure out how to give you a direct link to this, but let me just demonstrate how to get to it. Um, and then you know, that's good enough for now. So uh, the book is Understanding Video Games. So if you go to the library page and search for it here, it should come up. Oh, is this a new uh, a new style sheet for the or a new version of this search tool? That's okay, great. Um, now, as you often see, there are things that are not totally right, but this is the right one. Okay, so um, I didn't. It's part of a course. That's right. It's mine. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see what this. But it's okay. Anyway, so clicking here, you can see that there are multiple editions. I don't actually care which edition you look at, but the most recent one is, is good. And 
is this so I mean I'm curious if this is showing up it says it's part of a course and I'm wondering if it's that my if it's my course because kind of the problem is that it's not showing up as part of my course from the other side so I don't know maybe this is something that I, I can fix but uh, if you click online access hopefully this is gonna take me here yeah so this takes me to the cast authentication and um, yeah, here it is, right? Uh, and so this is a section that I'm, the, the thing I'm asking you to look, take a look at is just a small section of chapter three. And of course, you're welcome to look at the whole thing. I think it's a great introduction in a lot of ways. Um, it gets kind of wonky, but not too wonky. And I think that's what's really valuable about, it, valuable about it. In other words, it doesn't get super bogged down in different theoretical models or anything. It just, it discusses different the theoretical models. And that's what's going on in chapter three. But near the end of chapter three, uh, there's a pretty nice summary of uh, genre and an interesting idea for understanding genre that I haven't seen anywhere else. So um, this, I'm scrolling down to it, it's page 45, I think. Um, but it's talking about genre in the context of trying to understand what video games are, like what kind of thing they are. And I think that's the right way to do it. There it is, finally. Okay, page... 45, the issue of genre. That's the part I want you to read. This is really only like five or six pages of this textbook, um, but there's other parts that might be useful before and after it. Uh, I know it's cropped weird right now. This is just the interface because I have my, my you know, the, the size of my browser kind of compressed to make it look better on the stream, but um, hopefully you can find that. And, but I will also, I will figure out how to give you a direct link to this. Uh, I thought I already did. So, uh, because you know, the, the, the tool has this terminology permalink and you and I think it's reasonable to infer that perma means permanent and that it means that it will continue to work um, when in fact it doesn't so uh, this is one of my recurring complaints about ebook readers and um, and also ProQuest as a company honestly I think their their products are not are not good anyway so let's uh, we'll hopefully figure that out this other thing though this is totally this should just be a PDF, so this should work. Um, this is a PDF, and this is a chapter from uh, a book called The Medium of the Medium of the Video Game. And let me show you how to read this. This is uh, it's like 25 pages, but um, really the first part is the theoretical part, and then starting with abstract, um, he's basically this is Mark J P Wolf, and what he's doing is saying here's a here's my idea for what video game genres are, and then he gives you a list. And then the rest of this PDF is a short description of each of those. So you can kind of skim it from here on, I would say. Um, just, you know, maybe focus on the ones that you're interested in or the ones that seem unusual. So as you look through it, um, training simulation, that seems kind of unusual. Like what's the difference between a training simulation and a simulation or a management simulation, right? These are, uh, I, I think you'll find somewhat uh, awkward categories in some cases. So. Um, you know, read the explanation of his methodology and then kind of skim the uh, descriptions. I think, and that should uh, give you enough uh, to be prepared for class tomorrow. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see. And again, I will hopefully get that link figured out. All right, so this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be after, I, I'm, I'm nearing the end of my introduction for today. Uh, and what I'm going to be doing is talking about video game history, especially focusing on uh, generations, the first three video game generations, one, two, three. And many of these games, starting with the second generation, are available to play in emulation uh, because generation two, the really, the, the I guess, breaking point between generation one and generation two, it, conceptually anyway, is that this is when games become software. So these are things that is, it's games are, uh, it's programming, it's written in code, you can copy that code and run it somewhere else. And that's what we're doing when we emulate these things. And the Internet Archive has a tremendous resource called the Console Living Room, which has quite a lot of these in there. Um, you'll notice some uh, some omissions. I, it does not have any Nintendo games, and I assume that's for legal reasons, but there are plenty of other games from the same era that I think are uh, fun to look at. So that's what I'd like for you to do, uh, and really just split, spend an hour exploring these. And I've got links to these, uh, so let me show you how these work. So you go to, um, click on, let's take a look at Atari VCS. This is also chance for me to double check that. So here's a collection, yeah. So you can, uh, this collection has both software and other things in it, but um, there were about you know 520 games produced for the Atari 2600, so this is what we're looking at here. You can learn about the console here, um, and then you can play some of these games. So let's try 
So let's try let's try the classic uh, adventure. This is one of the games I'll try to play physically later on, um, but let's see how this works on the emulator. So let's see. Or is this? No, oh, no, this is a video. Okay, so that's not a game. I can't play it. Um, this is uh, yeah. So you can actually see, and I, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, it actually shows you if you look at the icon there. That's a that's a video, but the little disc there means that that's a ROM. I think so. Let's try. Um, let's try. That's a fun one. Oh, there's so many good ones. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. But let me try. Let's try ET. <laughs> um, ET is. Uh, that's okay. No, we can't. Can we not play it? Yeah, we can. I played it earlier. It doesn't have any that can be experienced. Okay. Um, Kelly, no, you should not worry about viruses if it's from Internet Archive. Uh, but if you if you Google um, play video games online or something like that, then you should in that case. But if these are safe, so these are good. I'm trying to find some that actually work. Let's try Frogger. There we go. So this one, when you see the click to begin, that means you can actually play it. Um, so, uh, you know, your mileage may vary, and of course this is why I say explore and see what you can find. And the first challenge you have to figure out with these emulators is what is the keyboard control schema? So, like, how do I control this game and what buttons on my keyboard uh, correspond to the switches on my Atari VCS console? And normally it's F1 to start a game, but I don't think they're going to let me use function keys here. Okay, it looks like the number one is letting me select a game. And F, yeah, the number two seems like it starts the game. Would, you would think, anyway. <laughs> I don't know. It's like a lot of trial and error. <laughs> and I'm so far trialing without error. Uh, uh, without, I'm so far experiencing errors. Let me see if it explains what the actual uh, control schema is for the buttons. Um, what well says to use the joystick 2017 that someone has some issues with it. Okay, well maybe if when you figure these out, like, share it in Discord and tell people what what works when you find one that works. Um, but I know many of these do. I'm just I've just been unlucky in selecting these uh, so far. Let me show you one that I uh, I know it does work because I tried it early this morning and had some fun with it. So if you look at the Sega Mas Sega Master System. Um, this is a, a, a generation, a third generation uh, game console. So let's take a look at this one. The, the control scheme is much simpler in this case. So let me show you how this works. Um, click to begin. Uh, now it's downloading the emulator and the metadata and the binary for the, the ROM cartridge and it should be loading here shortly. This is Alex Kidd in Miracle World. And here we go. Uh, now let's see. I was playing this on my Mac earlier, and what I found was that the control and the option buttons were the start and select buttons, and then the uh, arrow keys were uh, the like the the D pad, the control pad. ET's not that bad. <laughs> it's just misunderstood. <laughs> no, it is pretty bad. Okay, so control looks like it is the start key here. And let's see, I don't know if it's going to be Alt. Yeah, looks like Alt is select. Yeah, so my arrow, key, arrow keys are left and right, moving me left and right. And then Control is my jump button. Um, and, and then Alt is, well, it should be, but it's not. Nah. <laughs> it's not, I'm on a Linux keyboard, so sometimes things are not what you would expect them to be. So I'm going to have to find... Yeah, I don't know. I can't find the other, the punch button. <laughs> There's a punch action in this game, but I can't figure out what the keyboard control is for it. Anyway, you can uh, have fun with that. Um, what's going on? What are y'all talking about? Uh, E.T. did not crash the game market. Uh, the game market crashed itself. Um, but it's a, it's representative of the uh, some of the problems with the game industry, game industry at the time, uh, which had to do with uh, figuring out what the point of video games were. Um, and also, like the game itself was rushed and it wasn't great, um, but it is not solely responsible. I think Pac-Man has more uh, direct responsibility for crashing the game industry at the time. Um, yes, these, I mean, they, 
So Colin, I think they will if you have a controller input. I don't have a controller input set up here, um, but yeah, certainly try it and tell us how it works. So um, basically the point is explore, see what works, see what you can figure out, and then uh, come back and change and uh, tell people about it. And like I'm saying, and like I'm experiencing here, your mileage will vary and there will be some trial and error as you figure things out. So definitely share what your successes are if you find something that, that does work. Um, cool, so let's see, let's take a look. Uh, I think that makes sense if you have any questions or issues, uh, you know, it, it's, it's okay. Like I'm not gonna require you to play a minimum number or anything like that. Just do your best and uh, talk about it. So these are some of the questions I'd like for you to consider once you've had a chance to play some of these. Um, the, uh, yeah, oversat uh, just oversaturation of the market, but also um, you, you're investing the wrong way. So they, they spend a ton of money on the license for the ET uh, game and then um, didn't spend a lot of time on development, didn't give any um, uh, you know, attention to that. Um, and yeah, Kelly, these games are going to be older. Uh, in fact, some of these are, um, well, most of these that I'm, I've shown, like a uh, first generation and, and early second generation, these are older than me too. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with. Uh, but okay, so let's take a look at the, these are the things I'd like you to talk about. And I recommend making a collaboratively, collaboratively editable Google Doc so that you can record your thoughts and your conversation. And this will also make it easier for somebody to join in asynchronously later on if they need to. And these are just some suggested starting points as far as questions. So these are some things that you should look at now. And as you play these games, think about these questions. Um, and then after you've played the games, talk about these questions with each other. So things like, you know, how, how do you figure this stuff out? Like, how do you go from like, there's this thing on the screen and I have a keyboard, what do I do with it? Like, how does, how do you, how do you, how do you find what actually works and uh, what, and, and what did actually work? Um, uh, what are some of the games that actually seem to hold up or seem playable that you seem to enjoy uh, or spend, you enjoy spending time with? Uh, what are some of the design tropes or themes that you see across different games? Um, do you find them harder or easier than you expect? If you think of, if you lay aside the idea and the awkwardness of the emulator or the software that's running it or whatever, is the game itself harder or easier than you expect? Uh, many people, for example, find the uh, ET game, uh, as, is, as has been mentioned here in the, the chat, uh, they, they find it really um, obscure, like really hard to understand what you're supposed to be doing as you play the game. There is a game manual that explains what to do with it, but uh, even then it's a hard game. Like it's, it is challenging until you, get, um, until you uh, spend some time practicing with it. So um, the, um, sorry, I'm seeing conversations here. Um, you can do that if you want. I mean, I, I mean, I'm talking right now, so if you want to put things into resources, that would be great. If you can, if you can, I think you have permission to do stuff like that. Um, but if not, I can look at it later or give you permission later. Uh, okay, so other questions. Uh, among the first generation, um, there's, uh, sorry, that's not first generation, that's second generation. Um, among second generation games, one of the big conflicts or uh, I guess competitor competitions was between Atari, uh, Atari 2600 being their flagship console and in television, and I think there's an interesting set of arguments around and between those two. So uh, let me just, I need to update that reference there. Uh, and so I'm curious if you notice that, like if you can tell the difference between these games, if you play an in television game, does it make more sense or does it seem better uh, than, than um, the, the Atari games? Like can you, I mean, basically do you agree with George Plimpton? So take a look at some of these videos. Uh, they're really good commercials uh, from late 70s, early 80s, uh, uh, featuring George Plimpton, uh, of all people. And he is here to tell us um, why in television games are superior. And he, uh, I don't know, uh, he's a, as you can see here, he's a famous author. Um, and <laughs> I don't know, uh, he's a, he was like a, a famous author, essayist, uh, journalist, and uh, represented a particular kind of uh, style, I guess. Uh, like high class intellectual kind of guy. Uh, okay, so the, I mean, yeah, I'm not, uh, right, so I'm gonna have to turn off notification because your, your little blips, your, it like bleeps every time you guys are, are commenting, so I just turned that off. So I, I, I may not see those as quickly. Um, uh, but yeah, in terms of the, yeah, I don't wanna give you all full admin privileges, but I can give you certain privileges if it helps you, um, you know, custom, build out the space better. But let me, uh, Come back to that later if that's all right. Okay, great. So, so what is? Hold on a second. All right. 
AVG, sorry, AVGN, angry, angry video game nerd, nerd might argue with me about something. What do you think you might argue with me about? Um, okay, well, I guess finish your thought, and then, but uh, let me let me get started and lay some. Uh, well, let me lay some things out here for the slideshow, and then let me share also the slideshow while you're doing that if you want to. Cool, so let me make sure I get the right link. Okay, so I'm gonna share my slides in uh, the live stream chat channel in case you wanna look at it on your own. And, uh, and uh, these will be, I'm actually not done with this slideshow. As I said earlier, I kind of got into uh, first three generations and so I haven't finished the later generations. I think I'm just gonna add to this slideshow later, um, but you're welcome to go ahead and look at it if you want. I mean, just the rest of the, the second half is just uh, filler. Um, so, I mean, it's placeholder for me to fill things in later. Um, okay, so let's see if, uh, uh, if we can work our way through this. Um, now, there are a couple things to keep in mind before I get started even. Um, and I, I don't really have a slide for this, but I want to share some ideas about, um, I about what we're doing here. Like, uh, I'm going to be talking about video games in terms of generation. And as I said earlier, a generation is an organizational uh, structural uh, heuristic, a, a uh, artificial construct, a thing that lets us... Uh, it gives us a shorthand way to talk about groups of things. Um, it, I think, misleads us somewhat into thinking that the first generation led necessarily to the second generation and necessarily to the third generation and so on. I think the word generation, it's a, it's a patrilineal model of history. It's something that lets us see the present as a logical consequence of the past, but that's not what it seemed like at the time. Um, at each point, at several points in video game history, there was no certainty that there would be a future. Like there was no idea that, like the idea that there would be another generation or that there would be something else was was by no means guaranteed. And also what that next generation might look like was by no means guaranteed. Um, and so what we see instead of, uh, uh, I, I, I think the problem is that there's not a better word. Like I don't have another word to replace generations because I definitely recognize discrete groups, but um, I want to think of these groups more as like, instead of just like uh, uh, just like logical steps in a sequence, I want to think of these as like planes where possibility spreads out and then eventually possibilities merge and move in a specific gener uh, direction. And that next generation becomes its next kind of branch, almost like a rhizomatic like root structure of, of relationships as opposed to just a hierarchical this, then this, then this, then this, then this. And uh, when you look at this on like Wikipedia or other places, that's often how you see it organized. It's just like generation by generation by generation. And I, again, I think that misleads us into thinking the past was much more organized than it actually was. Uh, and I think if instead we look for um, uh, one way out of this or one way to start looking for the edges of that model is to think about the systems that didn't quite make it. So systems that don't quite fit into the generational model or that are technically part of one generation, but they actually have a features of a different generation. Like these are different ways to think about it. Um, yeah, and I think phases of revolution have some of the same issues in terms of that sense of progress, which is uh, what I'm trying to get away from. It's this idea of teleology, the idea that the end is a result of the beginning. And that's just, that's just not how history works. Uh, even, and within technology histories, we, all, we always see that. We always see those kinds of logical progression, like the logical natural evolution as though it was inevitable. Um, but yeah, and I think survival of the fittest too is another, I think, misleading metaphor for thinking about progress. Um, it's not that these things uh, had to exist the way they do, but uh, maybe not survival of the fittest, but if you maybe think more like Darwinian ideas of evolution, like uh, you know, uh, features emerge over time that gradually in uh, increase the rate of production. Like that's the kind of thing maybe that might work, except um, uh, towards the end of, um, you know, much faster evolution, I suppose, than, than natural evolution. Anyway, maybe it doesn't matter that much, but I just, I wanted to kind of put this idea out there that generations is, is a construct. Like it's a thing that we, um, that we can talk about. 
Um, yeah, and so Jack, as you're noting there, it is it does have to do with technology. So letting, letting us say like a new a new thing exists, and so because that new thing lets us make a different kind of video game, we can call that a new generation. But it's not just that it exists; it's that it's cheap and available, and that it's part of a design that meets certain consumers' needs. So uh, as an example, when we look at uh, so, so some people, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but some people like to talk about the uh, look at the generations in terms of uh, bits. Like, so we could talk about like the 8-bit generation, the 16-bit generation, the 32-bit generation. Um, that that's maybe a convenient shorthand or, for those different groups, but it's not literally true. Uh, like the Intellivision used a 16-bit processor in 1980, um, but it's definitely a third generation, not a fourth generation, right? So it's it's it has to do with other things like the processor speed, like the memory, like the graphics capabilities. Um, and the architecture of the system that let us let it accomplish the graphics, that's what really determines its relative value compared to others. It's all these things together. So yeah, and these are uh, these are the ways that we tend to think of these groups, right? Um, and it is for historians to decide, and that's that's the kind of thing I'm trying to decide, right? Um, I don't uh, I don't know if I would consider myself a historian per se, but at least in terms of uh, as, as video games, this is a, a thing I try to do. And this that that idea of his like. This conversation, this is historiography. Like it's a discussion about how we tell history, and that's what I think video games, uh, video game historians do a lot is actually talk about how they talk about it. And I think that's that's a sign of the, you know, the the maturity of the field at this point. Okay, so let's get into some things and just kind of go through it. I've talked about these generations, and I kind of am talking to it looks like mostly Al and Jack because you're you know commenting there. But uh, just I, I do want to go over and talk about the features of certain generations and show you some you know, key examples because I, I don't want to take for granted that all of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so I want to make sure that you see some of these. Uh, by the way, I've got a lot of really nice images in this slideshow, and I wanted to say that because. I found these all in um, uh, Wikimedia. Uh, so Wikimedia is a sister project of Wikipedia, and Wikimedia is like where the images that appear on Wikipedia come from, if that makes sense. And a Wikimedia user named Evan Amos uh, apparently uploaded all these really nice, uh, really cleanly cropped and well-lit images of all these game consoles that I'm gonna show you here. Um, and those were licensed uh, Creative Commons, uh, in some cases, or public domain in other cases. Um, and these are things that uh, I'm just, you know, I'm really impressed by that. And so I'm, I'm the, the way that they're licensed gives me permission to use them without acknowledgement, but I did want to acknowledge that Evan Amos did these and they're, they're really good. So let's talk about the first generation. Now, you notice that I'm using a tilde here. The tilde just means this is an approximate time range and there are not hard, fast divisions between these. You had uh, gener uh, consoles that are, by all definitions and features, clearly first generation still being made while second generation consoles were being made. So these definitely overlap for many years. Um, I mean, they still do, right? I mean, I can still play this. Like if I had a Magnavox Odyssey, I could still play it. It's not like it died and now I, you know, um, and now we can only remember it from the distant past. Like we still have these, like they all, they all still exist. So, um, I mean, Magnavox Odysseys are collector's items at this point, but, um, you know, they still work the same way they did and they haven't changed. Um, okay, so first generation, uh, this image here that you see is the Magnavox Odyssey and it is the, I think, key console, the most notable console from the first generation if we're thinking about this. A um, couple of key features, um, games tended to be single purpose, so you would have a game machine and it would just do one thing or four things or 16 things, but it would have, like, that's it. That's all it would, what it would do. There's no uh, plugging things in. Uh, there's no games on cartridges, at least. Um, now, I will show you one feature of the Magnavox Odyssey that some, that is a little bit confusing in that sense because it has what are called game cards, uh, but those game cards don't actually game, contain software. Like, they're not actually game code. Um, one of the things that led to the explosion of video games during this first generation is the so-called Pong and a Chip, and there are a couple of different models or different uh, manufacturers of these, but basically, uh, what we think of as a game console is a consumer product, like a box that plugs into our TV, but the heart of that is a chip, and the different manufacturers like General Instruments and T Texas Instruments, um, Motorola, MOS, um, I think Atari even, they made, uh, they, they would produce a microchip, so like a one inch square black uh, silicon thing that contains all of the code to run a game, and then you would just, you were a, uh, as a manufacturer, like you would just sort of buy a bunch of those and build a console around it. And so that's why you had like Sears and like Kmart and like uh, Bally's, like you had tons and tons and tons of uh, Pong systems. And these are things that, um, you know, that, that were all very similar to each other, 
actually played the same stuff on the inside in many cases. So it was really just like different versions of Pong, like different iterations on Pong. And so it became kind of overwhelming, kind of the same over and over again. And it, you know, it just didn't, uh, this is what led to, I think the first crash of video games or the first waning of video games as a thing because people kind of thought that's what video games were and like that was it. So I mentioned Family Game Night here. The, I wanted to show you some of the advertising and the uses of video games and in terms of uh, the home uh, d uh, domestic media experience because these are things that, as I said earlier, these are things that have to be described and invented and uh, people need to be convinced that this is the thing they need in their home so they need to see where it would fit in their home. Um, and one aspect of that is the uh, the design. So if you look at the just the physical design of the Magnavox Odyssey console, like the wood graining um, and even the angles on the sides, it looks very 70s. It looks very much like it belongs in the in a 70s living room. Uh, so uh, a couple other things like Coleco Telstar. I just mentioned that because I have one, um, but it's just one of many, many different uh, riffs on it. I have um, the light gun version of the Telstar. So that's the, you know, the same. Uh, technology as the uh, the window, um, the, sorry, the Nintendo Zapper, right? The the light gun. That's technology that Ralph Baer invented in the 1960s, and that um, was already available for the Magnavox Odyssey. And um, even in a way, the Wii controller is a, a descendant of that same technology, the same idea. The Wii controller, um, as you probably you know, you know what those are, you wave them around. It's actually not emitting light; it's receiving light from the sensor bar. So, you know, the sensor bar, they call it the sensor bar, but the thing you, you stick to the bottom of your TV, that's actually spraying out infrared light. And then your, um, uh, the controller is like picking up that light and then picking, then determining its location relative to the TV based on what light it's receiving from the sensor bar. So it's a interesting, uh, uh relative ancestor, uh, of its, um, it has a interesting ancestor in the light gun. All right, so these are just a few of these. Uh, let's take a look at the Magnavox Odyssey again. Yeah, um, so you've got cards that plug in to let you change out the game, um, but these are not like games on cards, so to speak. These are cards that rewire the light output, and you'll see it in this the next uh, slide here, um, that make it instead of two dots, it's one dot, or maybe it's a dot and a line or something like that. So these are basically just sending different circuitry signals through the machinery of the console to create different light patterns on the screen vis-a-vis uh, -vis the controller. So uh, that, that's all it does. They aren't actually recording any, any of the games. In a way, you could say the game content in many cases was um, like the stick on, like the thing that you put on the screen, but also the experience that you create when you play it together. Like the tennis game didn't have a score display. Like it didn't say what the score was on the screen. So you and your sister or whoever you're playing with would have to keep score together. And that experience of playing together, keeping score, the normal kinds of arguments that happen when you do that sort of thing, that becomes the game experience um, much more so than the, um, the console itself. So really what you see is that uh, the game console is not an entirely self-contained experience. It's there to serve something else. It's there to be a part of Family Game Night that um, lets you experience your TV in a different way too. So I wanted to show you this, and I think I'll probably just show the whole thing, and I will make sure my sound is up. So let me make sure I can check on the preview stuff. Um, this is a film I found on YouTube. YouTube is, of course, the great gold mine. Um, of, or landmine in some cases, of these kinds of things. Um, this is a 1972, this is like basically a long commercial um, explaining what a Magnavox Odyssey is and hopefully it plays okay. It looks like it's playing. It looks like the sound's coming through. Uh, let me know if you can hear the sound on the video. What did your family do on those stay indoors rainy afternoons or on those cold, blustery winter days? Okay, I can't help but pause it every now and then and, and uh, comment. Um, and also, let me, yeah, I'll turn on the closed captions. I don't know if it actually has closed captions, but we'll see. Families who are content to let television do its thing often find themselves at its mercy for a choice of entertainment. While people who want television to do their thing entertain themselves with odyssey so so right there i, just, I love that that statement that um you know some people are content to let the tv do whatever but not odyssey consumers they take control and so this idea that they're taking control back i think that's really kind of a, an unusual argument to make <laughs> 
the electronic game of the future, and the family's best foul-weather friend. Odyssey can be attached to any brand television receiver with a screen size of 18 to 25 inches, either black and white or color. And an ordinary screwdriver is the only tool needed to attach this Odyssey antenna game switch to the antenna terminals on the back of the television set. Once the antenna game switch is attached, you can select the TV position for regular television viewing or the game position for playing your favorite Odyssey game. Odyssey is played through an unused VHF channel of your television set and operates on six common size C-cell batteries which come packed with the unit. Simply connect the game core to the antenna game switch on the back of the set and to the master control unit. And plug the player control unit cords into their respective sockets on the master unit. And your Odyssey is ready to begin entertaining your family. Each Odyssey game uses one of these special game cards which plug into a slot at the front of the master control unit. The game cards activate lights on your television screen that bounce, float, or extinguish on contact, depending upon the particular game you've chosen to play. For example, to play Odyssey Tennis, you insert game card number three into the master unit. This activates three lights. Um, yeah, just another brief comment here. Notice how the terminology is like these cards activate different lights on the screen. And that's that's what you do. And yeah, it's battery based. It, you, I think they did re release a uh, AC powered version later, but the uh, yeah the, the battery is kind of funny. I don't know how long that battery would last. Um, yeah. Two representing the players and one representing the ball. Press the special tennis game overlay into position on the television screen, and you're ready to begin an exciting, fast-paced tennis game. The horizontal knob on the left side of each player control unit allows you to move your player light in a left to right or right to left direction. The vertical knob on the right side of each player control unit lets you move your player light in an up and down direction. All right, I think that's good enough. Actually, let me just skip to the end and see if there's anything else. They, they go over some of the um, peripherals. You can get like a nice carrying case for it. Also available as an option is this special organizer case with separate compartments designed to hold all games and equipment. It makes setup a breeze and storage or moving of your Odyssey units sheer pleasure. Sheer pleasure <laughs> to move it. Yeah, and I so lots of interesting things, and I I'm, I'm I'm drawing attention to this a little bit because I you all are, are your first product this week is to create something like this for a game, uh, like a, make a, a commercial, and uh, you noticed all the different uh, appeals, right? The visual rhetorical appeals here, like this is the family together, this is dad bringing this thing home, like the family has a problem and dad solves it, like the 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 family's bored because it's snowing and so dad is like you know what we're going to take control of our tv and you know the dad is the one the bringer of fun in this case and the the handler of the tool the uh the, the screwdriver um so this is something that you'll see over and over again like the um uh the the father at the the father figure at the center of the domestic media experience and this is something that predates video games and continues to this day so it's something that is a recurring feature in visual uh, rhetoric around uh, domestic media domestic media use and consumption but you know, it's the family together. Uh, most of these games are really only are, can only be two game, two player. Like they don't even make sense uh, if to play as a one player. I don't think. Um, but there's even a, a couple of hints about these being educational, which is something you'll see in many cases too early on. Uh, video games trying to uh, video game publishers trying to appeal to parents to uh, argue that these games actually are or might be educational. Um, and those are somewhat dubious claims sometimes, but uh, you know, interesting. Now, nevertheless, as far as making the argument for these things to exist. All right, so let me move on. Okay, that here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show this because I love this, the, the console design. Uh, so this is Magnavox Odyssey 300. The gameplay itself is just another Pong on a chip at this point. Uh, there's nothing super exciting about the game itself. Um, I've never even played one, but it's something that I just, the, the form factor is really cool looking. I just really like that. Uh, it, it looks like, you know, it looks like uh, Kill Bill, the outfit that she wears in that. Um, it's, I don't know, it's just super slick. Um, I also randomly found out when I was trying to learn more about this console is that they were built in a factory in East Tennessee that was right just a couple blocks down from uh, the dorm I lived in in college. Uh, I went to a small college in East Tennessee 
and um, these were built there. Like in one of my normal running routes, I would go by it every, you know, almost every day. And I, I never knew that it was just a big empty warehouse when I was uh, living there as part of uh, the general. Um, I guess uh, this was in the the '90s, early 2000s, but. Um, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a move to push uh, electronics manufacturing out of Silicon Valley into Appalachia. So like East Tennessee, Southwest Virginia, Kentucky, um, as a place for relatively cheap labor. And there was also another um, a similar kind of investment in New Mexico to try to uh, get uh, uh, labor from uh, Native, Native Americans living in reservations there. Um, and then by the 1980s, a lot of that moves to Hong Kong, China. Uh, and so this is, uh, so the fact that this art, the console was manufactured in Jefferson City, Tennessee, uh, I think is pretty significant and interesting as an, a history of how labor, um, how video game labor has moved around. In fact, it used to be um, uh, relatively local in the sense of, at least my experience of, of local. So I thought that was pretty interesting, just as a kind of tidbit. Um, okay, so on to the second generation. So the... Um, uh, there's a couple general features of these and quite a lot more, uh, much uh, a bigger proliferation of differences within this. Um, the uh, major thing that makes these, is, makes these possible is the proliferation of CPUs. And so these are uh, chips that are general purpose that can do lots of different things and you can plug different things into them. Uh, as opposed to the Pong in a chip that just does Pong, uh, the MOS 6502 can do just about anything as long as you kind of build some features around it and then write some code that addresses the different pieces of it. Um, and most arcade games uh, are based on Z80s or 6502s. Um, and also the cheaper versions like the 6507, I think it's 07, um, is available for uh, in, in even cheaper. And so Atari is able to use those to design the Atari VCS console around it. Um, so it's really the availability of those that makes the second generation possible in the first place on a technological basis. Um, and then uh, it also makes it possible to write um, programming code for those processors and then even to start building uh, operating systems essentially like r really rudimentary operating systems or BIOSes for like in television and the uh, channel F where you can write code on a uh, custom programming environment basically. So that leads to the proliferation of third-party development and you get the, the whole kind of cartridge industry uh, from that era. So games, uh, this is also the idea of games as software. They are sold separately and there's an interesting um, evolution that happens. And I think um, that's the uh, distinction. And, and this picks up much more so in the next generation, I think. But you see the transition in generation two, which is the difference between a cartridge and a game. So this is a cartridge. This is it's mirror image, but this is cartridge 16 uh, for the Channel F console. Um, I have some Atari console cartridges over there. Um, but what was interesting is like, what are you buying when you buy this? Are you buying Video Cart 16 or are you buying the game Dodge It? Because this has the game Dodge It on here and yeah, that's it. It just has one and two player Dodge It. That's it. Um, other game cartridges for the uh, Channel F had four games on them. Uh, four different games that had no relationship to each other. They just all happened to be on Video Cart 12 or whatever it was. And I have two more of these somewhere, but I don't remember where they are. Um, the uh, so there's a but there's a transition. And now when we buy a game, um, we don't even buy physical media anymore usually. But if we did buy physical media, we would kind of just take for granted that we're buying that game and it's a piece of physical media that contains that game and that's it. And that was certainly true in the third generation forward, but uh, there is a, again, an, an evolution. There's a teaching, uh, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a shift. There's something that has to be taught uh, that these are, um, that's what you're buying is you're buying a game. You're not buying the cartridge that contains the game, you're buying a game. And there is a difference to that. So uh, some of the key consoles here um, are Atari VCS, uh, Mattel and Television, ColecoVision, um, quite a few others, uh, but these are kind of the big ones that did pretty well, although really Atari VCS uh, by far dominates this generation. Um, the emphasis, and I think this is what leads to the downfall that um, a couple of you were alluding to earlier, uh, one of the emphases that you see in this generation is attempting to replicate the arcade experience. And I think that is in many cases unsuccessful in this era. Uh, many of the home versions of arcade games, especially for the Atari VCS, were very bad and disappointing to people. So whenever they bought them, they didn't feel like they got a good value and they didn't want to buy it again. I uh, didn't want to play it anymore. 
Um, I think the games that really stand out from that generation are the games that were created uh, inherently on the Atari VCS. So games like Combat and Adventure, um, there was an Atari Combat in the arcade, but uh, the, the game that people remember, the Combat game that people remember is Combat for Atari VCS. Um, there's also uh, Adventure for Atari, which is uh, created for the Atari VCS. There uh, was not, as far as I know, an, an arcade version of it, but it was built for that system and it worked pretty well on that system. And that's really what um, I think contributed to the success of the Atari, at least creatively. Um, but commercially, uh, the, the big investment that Atari made and then when they sold to Warner Brothers, the investment that they made in um, intellectual property, like the big investment in ET, uh, like the rights to adapt um, to, to create a port for Pac-Man. Uh, these were investments that proved to be bad investments and um, you know that led to kind of the oversaturation of the market. Um, I should say, by the way, one of the things that led to the end of um, the first generation, as you see with this console, uh, the Odyssey 300, is that there were just so darn many of them and they were all the same that people got bored. Like people thought, well, that was interesting. These video games are uh, none, I guess, uh, and then they sort of forgot about it. The, the arcade experience was something else, but the home console was just just pong, basically. So uh, it really kind of uh, the market was oversaturated, not just with uh, well, just it was just oversaturated with lots and lots of different consoles that were all pretty much the same. Um, you do have a similar problem in the second generation, except you have an oversaturation of kind of low quality games, and the part of that has to do with uh, again the the weird licensing agreements, but also the fact that anyone could create a game for Atari. So it, uh, once you learn how to program it, any third party developer could, um, could make it. Um, yes, and, and they definitely will be. Um, I posted yesterday's slides on the, um, uh, the module day for yesterday. So I'll put these on, uh, on today's day <laughs> uh, when I'm done. So yes, um, there is um, yeah, good point about Activision, by the way. And actually, I was about to mention Activision because Activision is kind of famous for being the first third, the first major third-party developer. I think the first actual, but the first well-known uh, third-party developer for Atari. And they were basically disgruntled former Atari employees. And they, they went off and made their own company because they knew how to make the games. So they went off and made their own company, published them on their own. And um, uh, one of the things that the, they were unhappy about is that they were not being recognized as creative workers. Also, of course, they, they wanted to get paid more, um, but they uh, these programmers would uh, not have their names on the cartridge or in the credits or anything, and so they would they would feel disappointed by that. And then um, when you look at the Activision games, they're always they they do have their um, the designer's name sometimes on the cover of the cartridge packaging or at least you know in the in the instruction manual somewhere. So very much they were very much about thinking of their programmers as creative uh, workers. Okay, and I mentioned Adventure earlier too. Adventure, I don't have it here, but the Adventure uh, game for Atari, which I, again, one of the ones I'll hopefully demo later, um, it was significant because in light of that problem, in light of the fact that pr programmers weren't paid very well and also weren't given credit for their games, Warren Robinette, who was the programmer for that game, um, snuck his name into the game as an Easter egg. So there is a way to find his name in the actual content of the game. And it's the not the first, but the first well-known video game Easter egg. So uh, pretty interesting. Uh, okay, so these were comparatively cheap compared to other systems like Intellivision um, and Channel F. Channel F was pretty expensive um, um, by comparison, but the Atari VCS was incredibly popular. And I think if you look at the name, you can see part of what they're doing. They actually kept making these up into the 90s, but um, it very much was superseded by other things in the by the mid 80s. And really the market, if anything, was saturated with Atari VCS's uh, video computer system. If you notice that name there, that's a really um, aspirational name. Like this is not, I mean, it's sort of a computer, but not really like it's technically, you know, it's got programming in it, but it's really not a computer in any way that we would think of. But they were trying to capture that excitement or the idea around computers as the next big thing. And so we're gonna do this. And Atari did go on to make quite a few computers, um, but the Atari video computer system it really is not a computer. Um, they later named it the 2600 after they released the 5200 so they could show a kind of progression. So the idea that the 5200 is like the next generation from the 2600 is something that they kind of created retroactively. But we tend to know it now as the 2600. Um, that's the name that we tend to think of it. I actually don't know off the top of my head what the meaning of those numbers actually is other than that generational reference. Um, then the 7800 is what came out after the 5200. 
So I'm not really sure what value is being, you know, what is actually being doubled there. Uh, but anyway, these are, uh, this was the big one. And I, I always like to look at advertising. I think advertising tells us so much about how a game was perceived, but also what's cool about it is they often will show people playing the game. So you can see a game in emulation and you can kind of experience it yourself, which is good. But also it's like seeing people manipulate the controllers, uh, I think gives you a better sense of, of it. I think the best scenario is to play it in, in physical form yourself, but the commercial uh, adds that feature into it as well. I actually wanted to show not that one first, but let's see, let me do this one first. Um, these commercials are not, the resolution is not very good, but you can hopefully get the idea of what's going on. It's just, these are the best ones, the best versions I could find. Um, and these are, you know, only effects. Atari makes the world's most popular home video games. The only Space Invaders. The only Asteroids. The only Pac-Man. The only Missile Command. And soon, the only Defender. And the only way you can play any of them is on a home video system made by Atari. <laughs> So that whole theme song there, right? So that's um, only Atari. The the theme song is uh, a great, uh, you know, it's just the <laughs> commercials in the '80s all had theme songs, first of all. Um, but there is a full version, like with lyrics of this theme song, and and you can find other, you know, if you, it doesn't take long. If you just search, if you just watch one of these on YouTube, it'll keep suggesting many more of these, and they had dozens. Um, but there's a full version of, and then they also do like full versions of that song featuring different games whenever they release a new game. But if you notice those games, most of those were uh, arcade ports. So Defender, Space Invaders, Missile Command, uh, I forget what else they showed in that. Um, those are, uh, they licensed those and, or they were actually the, the producer of them originally, and then um, they made a home version of them. And so this idea that this is the home version of these games that you already know, that kind of helps people understand what they're doing here. But as you can also kind of see, this is showing actual gameplay and it's really not that good. I mean, like, okay, Breakout is fine. Um, Breakout is super minimalist anyway. But if you'll notice on the Space Invaders, the monsters don't look right. Like that's not actually, um, that's not how they look in the arcade game. So uh, that had to do with the licensing problem with Tato who uh, produced the original Space Invaders. Um, so the, you got this and it's like, yeah, you, gameplay is basically the same. You shoot monsters, but they look different, right? Um, this is the, uh, this is Missile Command. It looks all right. Uh, Defender. I think it's decent for what it's trying to do, but definitely a far cry from the real Defender if you get to play Defender. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's in many ways you can see how people might be disappointed by this. Um, but the whole idea too that I wanted, the, the other reason I like this commercial is the way that like the whole family comes out. Like, you know, this is something that we're all doing together and we're super hyped about. So it's something that, you know, brings a family around the TV again. It kind of brings your kids back inside and they're all together. Uh, they're not running around. Um, in the streets or whatever, they're all together uh, playing these video games. Uh, let's see, what other ones did I pull up here? Um, yeah, so this is another one Ed, that I enjoy a lot. Um, this is another an example of a game for a specific commercial. So Berserk was a game that already existed in the arcade. Uh, very popular, very interesting, and actually kind of unusual game. And uh, this is uh, a commercial for the Atari, the home version of it. So again, the theme song, and uh, you can't play it. You know, you can't play Atari at home, but yes, you can. And I just, I love the grandma's reaction, like the <laughs> Atari. Like she's so excited about Atari, um, and she's right. It is exciting. You can play Berserk at home, uh, but it also, you know, there's also an argument here that this is the kid and the mob, I mean the grandma, like they're spending time together, this is fun, like um, it's bringing the family together and that's a, a value that this game is trying to get, get at. Um, even though that game itself, Berserk, was controversial for um, depicting violence, like that actually depicts um, like the, the beings that you're fighting are uh, supposed to be robots, but they look like stick figures and you look like a stick figure and you're shooting each other and so people um, 
I think, you know, understandably, perhaps retro retrospectively thought of that as, you know, maybe an issue that we're, we're promoting violence. So this is another really interesting one. Um, this is, uh, I just found this one today, actually, in looking for things. I, never, I don't think I've seen this before. Um, this is a commercial, um, well, well, I'll just show it to you. We down deep inside of the sea man He's a little boy and it's how he's Sam And without any doubt The boy will come out when he plays the games on Atari Have you played Atari today? Give a man an Atari game and he'll turn into a little boy But don't worry, he'll be grown up enough to share it Have you played Atari? Hey, so it's kind of hard to understand what the singer is saying there, but I think she's saying that this um, this is a in, inside something like every inside every man is a little boy, and uh, Atari brings out the little boy, but he's still a man. So there's like this interesting kind of Freudian stuff going on there. I think this idea of like this, this um, like letting out this repressed inner child, um, but also this, this idea of like this adult man becoming obsessed with um, breakout. There actually was a book written. Uh, 1982, I think, by David Sudnow, Sudnow called Pilgrim in the Micro World. It's a beautifully written book, actually, but he, he talks about gra uh, gra becoming obsessed with this particular video game, with Breakout. And um, it's written in really beautiful prose, but it's it describes a kind of obsession and a compulsion, and he, be, you know, he, um, he basically reorganizes his entire life in a way that we would recognize as pretty unhealthy. Uh, around this video game breakout. He was a psychologist, so he was actually writing it as sort of a self, like an autoethnography, I think. Um, but it, yeah, it's really interesting that this commercial almost seems to foreshadow that book, or maybe it was about the book. Maybe, you know, maybe there's, there's some interesting connections there. Anyway, this idea of, uh, again, the, the father figure as the one who brings home the game uh, is something that you see really underscored here in this uh, particular uh, commercial. Uh, okay, so I think just a couple more slides, and I, you know, Again, commercials Only a tell us so much. Um, Berserk, yeah. Did I put the other one in here? So it keeps playing. I don't want to play them. I feel like I showed this commercial, but I can't remember, honestly. I'm going to show it in anyway. Um, I, I just I, I can't remember if I actually showed this or not. Um, this is the Atari 5200, which is trying to do a much better job of um, bringing home the arcade experience. And it really did, actually. I mean, the games definitely were close, very much like the originals uh, from the arcade with the Atari 5200. Um, but uh, for various other reasons, the, the console itself was pretty expensive and the controls were weird, so people didn't really like it. Um, but it's, uh, they, in terms of getting the arcade experience at home, uh, they, like the ColecoVision, did a really faithful job of porting it. And I think in some cases, just literally ported the same exact software. But take a look at this commercial, see if you can pick up on uh, a different style or different set of values that they're appealing to. Um, with this. So this is another great sort of visual rhetoric piece. So let's take a look at this one. <laughs> wait, 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 wait till you see what they do to the beach. The really hot video games come from Atari. We've got Centipede, Ms. Pac-Man, <laughs> Vanguard, and Galaxian. If you <laughs> thought it was going to be just another summer, Atari is going to turn your head around. The hot names, the hot games, the hot deals. Yeah, it's gonna be a whole lot, cause nobody's hotter than Atari this summer. Nobody's hotter than Atari. All right, so did anyone pick up on any uh, sexual innuendo, perhaps, uh, with what was going on there? Um, yeah, it's it's a little bit like I almost I almost gave you a content like warning ahead of showing that it's it's pretty um, racy, I guess, and you know, plugging into the beach, the close up shots on the joystick, like this seems like a lot going on there, a lot to unpack there in that commercial, uh, as we might say uh, today, but it's. Um, Definitely a different set of appeals, but the main, I guess, claim they're making about Atari 5200 is that it 
lets you do the same thing you might do at the arcade, but all this other stuff too. Like look at the kind of people that are doing this and look what kind of fun they're having and look what little they're wearing as they do these things. So yeah, definitely a lot of um, sort of unnecessary sexiness there. Uh, okay, so I, that, I think that's the last commercial I have pulled up here and I did wanna, yeah. So third generation, I'm, I know I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna go into the third generation, but just suffice it to say that really the Nintendo Entertainment System dominates, but there are others and the, uh, a big thing to keep in mind in terms of kind of the, the generational model, it's not so much that the second generation led to the third generation, but kind of like what happened with first generation going into the second, is that video games as a thing basically died out. Like basically people stopped buying video games. And earlier people were mentioning the, uh, you know, the, the responsibility of ET as that, that game in terms of kind of uh, killing the industry, um, certainly didn't help. Um, it wasn't solely responsible, but it certainly didn't help. Um, other kind of bad decisions by Atari management led to the saturation of things and it, you know, basically people stopped buying video games. So when Nintendo produced their product, they had to kind of convince people to play video games again. And they ultimately, of course, made a, a very compelling argument and it, it worked out well. Uh, so we still have video games, so it, it worked out. But there was definitely a sense that uh, that might not work out. Um, yeah, and the NES, again, these are uh, very popular. Um, you know, many people still have them. Um, I have a couple. Uh, they actually, they're very durable. Uh, if they sometimes do require repairing the, um, the part of the console that receives the cartridges. Um, it's kind of like, sort of like a mouth that kind of slides the cartridge, the cartridge card actually fits into. And that part often needs to be cleaned or uh, replaced. Uh, many people incorrectly, and this is one of the kind of urban legends or myths, this is one of the things that you learned how to do when you had these is whenever the cartridge wouldn't load correctly, when the game wouldn't load, wouldn't load you would blow on it to uh, make it work. And unfortunately, yeah, so it's killing me. Yeah, that is the thing that people think um, you really shouldn't blow on it. Um, so if there's dust on the uh, actual um, uh, card part of it, then yeah, you can clear the dust off and that's good. But you should clear it off with like a compressed air thing or uh, maybe rubbing alcohol. Problem is that if you blow on it, you get some spit on it and the spit will uh, cause rust and corrosion. So it will uh, make it worse over time. Uh, whereas, you know, if you just blow it off with compressed air or something that evaporates instantly, then you'll be much better off. Um, but yeah, um, cool. So uh, I think I'm gonna wrap it up here. I actually don't have um, any, any Nintendo commercials pulled up here, but it definitely, they definitely had them. Um, and one of the things that they did, I, I guess I should mention just in terms of the overall industry stuff is, um, if you remember Atari, you had a lot of games that were produced by third parties and the quality varied widely. So Activision games were great, um, but there were also some really terrible Atari games. There's quite a few, I should actually warn you, if you are exploring things in the uh, uh, console living room archive, there are some uh, pornographic titles for the Atari 2600 um, by a company called Playaround. So, and you can, you will definitely know that that's what that is. Like it won't surprise you with pornographic content, like you'll see it. But just uh, just heads up, they are there and they are incredibly offensive. Um, I don't recommend playing them. <laughs> so, uh, but they are, I mean, it's important to know that they exist as cultural artifacts, but they were just an example of the kind of garbage that you could produce for the Atari. And um, Nintendo had, uh, they exercised control over their cartridge. So you had to actually pay them to produce a cartridge for Nintendo. And people did do, uh, find ways to reverse engineer that and get around that there were um, kind of, I guess bootleg uh, cartridges or other cartridges um, that uh, people created for Nintendo, but were not officially uh, licensed by, or you know, weren't technically allowed to do that by Nintendo, but um, not very many. And so Nintendo, I think, part of what led to their success was their ability to control their their product. Uh, okay, so that's about all I'm going to talk about for today. So what I'd like for you to do now is take a look at some things on, uh, yeah, you're mentioning that one. Custer's Revenge is the most notorious one. Um, don't even, I mean, don't even look at it. It's terrible. Um, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's pornographic, horribly racist as well. So just don't even. Um, but uh, sorry, the, um, your homework or not homework, but your now work is uh, check some things out in the console living room, see what works. And as I showed you earlier, the your mileage may vary. It, you may find things that don't work. Um, that's just how it goes with these things. Uh, but if you do find something working, spend some time playing it, um, and then share your ideas in your Discord channels. Use your uh, your team channels, especially to share whenever you find something that really works well or that you really like. Um, and then uh, let's say you know around 12:30 or so, 
yeah, so around 12.30 or so, that's when you should uh, be back in Discord chatting with your group about uh, what you did, what you learned, and those questions on today's notes. Uh, kind of go through those and see what, see what you learned and what you noticed and kind of see if you can answer those questions. So I'll put the tab up over here. Oops, I accidentally closed the tab. Um, and while you're doing that, I'm gonna see if I can get this link figured out to that part of the textbook, or I might just um, make a PDF from it. And um, I'm gonna try to set up my Atari and my Channel F. Uh, but this is, yeah, these are the things that I want you to look for as you play some games in the console living room. So check it out and kind of be back online around 1230. But I'll be streaming again at 1.15. So 1.15 is when I hopefully will demo some things and kind of see how your conversations and discoveries went. Of course, you're welcome to eat lunch or do whatever else you need to in the meantime. All right, cool. Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, this has been a fun uh, introduction to sort of the first half of video game history or first third. Um, I'll do the rest tomorrow along with some discussion about video game genres. Uh, then on Thursday, we're going to talk about arcade games. If you notice, I've been talking about console games today. Arcade games have their own parallel history, but really um, essentially one generation uh, in the 1970s, really 70s and 80s is really when the arcades, uh, arc arcades are a significant um, thing. But what we're going to, I'll go and tell you, what we're going to do on Thursday is um, I'll give you a similar kind of lecture where I explain kind of his basic history of arcade games. And then we're going to have a couple of guest speakers. Uh, this is Jim Groom and Tim Owens, and they are the co-owners of an arcade that is opening in Fredericksburg uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so they've built an arcade um, around the idea of like historical preservation, essentially, of older video games. And they are making that available and they are opening soon finally uh, their opening had to be delayed by a year because of covid but uh, they are finally just about ready to go so uh, i thought it'd be cool to hear them talk about what they're what they're doing and some of the problems they've had to solve as they've um, acquired and had to repair older systems and kind of get things uh, working and ready for people to play so i think that'd be pretty interesting uh, the name of the arcade is reclaim arcade so you can check it out if you want to at reclaimarcade.com and they have a it, because of uh, you know COVID restrictions right now they're doing it, you have to reserve time but you can go ahead and reserve time um, for a two hour slot and they do it with I think that it's uh, you, you reserve a two hour time slot and then everything is free to play in the in the room everything and they have fifty I think over fifty uh, arcade machines at this point. So yeah, it's been really cool. They've actually got a lot of great stuff on their website uh, talking about the their research process and the stuff they found. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from them and uh, asking them some questions. So anyway, um, so uh, have fun playing on the console living room and check out um, yeah check out some things and uh, try to be back online around 12:30 and then I will be streaming again at 1:15. Okay, thanks for watching everyone. Take care. See you later.